that's great. Thank you so much in there. And um, I tell you, I am so excited and honored to be part of the kickoff of this incredible five-day summit. I'm, it's just, when I found out about what is being organized here the, at the Futuro Institute, I'm, I'm just so excited because this is exactly the kind of movement that moves us towards what I'm going to be describing to you in this next in, in this presentation right now, this vision of an ecological civilization. So I'm I'm just I, I just can't say how much I feel so aligned with what I see happening here today. And so as Samir said, I'm going to actually move into a presentation mode in a minute. Um, and then that'll be for about half an hour or so, and then we can go into a Q&A. So if, if, as you're listening, any questions or comments come up, please do, I urge you, as Samir said, to just put them in the chat. And so we've got, uh, we've got that for discussion later on. So I'm gonna be talking today, before I move into the presentation, about um, this vision of an ecological civilization. And it's one that I've gotten very excited about in the last couple of years as I've gotten to um, see what has been thought about in terms of it. And, um, and I've really sort of embraced it as something that I've put a lot of my time and energy in. So at this point, I will share the screen. Uh, now it says host disabled attendee screen sharing. So it seems like I am viewed as a, an attendee. Is there any way that you could make me a host right now? So Rob, I think that question is for you. Jeremy would like to share a screen. I see a chat saying I've been made a host already. Well, that is Excellent. pretty damn efficient. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Rob. Um, so, okay, let's move to the screen share now. And I think that works for everybody, if I'm not mistaken, right? <clears throat> okay, great. So, um, well, so we're going to be talking about toward an ecological civilization. And um, because I, I'm so excited about what's being done today and at this summit right now, I thought maybe the way to really kick off thinking about it is to look at the name of this <clears throat> summit, Negotiating the New Normal. It's an exciting name. Um, but I think it's reasonable for somebody to look at that and just basically ask the question, well, <clears throat> what's wrong with the old normal? Like, why do we need to negotiate a new normal? So the way I want to sort of feel into <clears throat> this, this vision of what's possible in the future is to look at what's actually happening right now. And then maybe the best way to do that is to just kind of zoom out a little bit and actually look for a moment at our beautiful planet, <clears throat> the earth from space. And there it is all alone in the, in the darkness. And the only place we know of <clears throat> right now in the universe that has life on it. And in this beautiful, place life evolved billions of years ago and yet it's only been really in the last few decades that one species on this <clears throat> incredible beautiful jewel of a planet um, got to develop the technology to actually fly out to the moon where this picture is taken from and look back at our planet and as humans we have developed this amazing powerful technology so much so that it's been actually changing the earth itself um, and so we obviously need to ask, what, how have we been stewarding this technology? How are we doing with this incredible power that we found at our hands? Um, and the very sad answer is we've been doing terribly. Uh, there's just vast ecological <clears throat> destruction across the board. You know, most of you <clears throat> are familiar with the whole issue about climate breakdown. And you've probably seen some kind of graph that looks something like this, like our emissions are going up <clears throat> in the wrong direction. We need to get them down um, quite drastically right away, basically, to try to keep warming below one and a half degrees Celsius. Um, but even uh, the pledges uh, that no nations have already made right now uh, from COP21 uh, some years back are totally insufficient to get us to where we need to go. And as we, if we carry on in this direction, what's even more terrifying 
is that then these feedback loops start happening. And serious scientists look at this situation uh, and they basically are, uh, sh they're expressing the concern that as these, as these feedback loops get out of control this century, and nobody knows exactly when we pass those tipping points, we may be moving to a different state for the earth system and really one that is not compatible with civilization and we would see our civilization collapse. But here's the thing, even if we were able to, through some sort of magic bullet, fix climate breakdown and fix the greenhouse gas emission issue right away, <clears throat> right now, we'd still be, there would still be an, a whole slew of major environmental disasters that we're heading to right now through our overconsumption. I'll just give you a sense of just a few of those. Like, it's hard to believe, but there's been a 68% decline in animal populations around the world from 1970 to the present day. And as part of that, we're heading towards the sixth great extinction of species on earth. And uh, the first five since life began have been as a result of natural occurrences. This extinction is human, is based on human activity. We're looking at the virtual certain annihilation of coral reefs worldwide this century. And the UN has <clears throat> forecast that we can expect 95% of the Earth's land to be degraded by 2050. But of all these statistics, I'll take you through the one that just blows my mind away the most. Is this one. <clears throat> by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish at this current rate <clears throat> of where, where we're going. Just totally mind blowing. Now, the thing is all this is happening <clears throat> with this global pr um, production right now of our GDP, but, if, but conservative forecasts by mainstream bankers are looking at this <clears throat> production and consumption, this whole system tripling <clears throat> by roughly the middle of this century. So we have to ask ourselves, what kind of craziness is this? Like, why is this going on? Why are we headed towards this destructive path? Well, a lot of the underlying reason for this comes down to this growth-based global economy that we're in. This is just a chart that shows this notion of <clears throat> price to earnings ratio, which may be roughly 20 or whatever, which basically <clears throat> says that um, the value of stocks around the world are valued at a multiple of what they're actually doing this year based on this assumption of their growth. And <clears throat> so that price to earnings ratio is basically how much the value of the stock is multiplied by what they're actually earning this year. <clears throat> so what that means is that if a company has a certain amount of earnings that it's producing this year in 2020, the value of that company in the stock market is a hypothetical. It's based on this presumption that that company will keep growing and um, so rapidly that they'll be earning 20 times more, maybe sometime over the next 20 years or so. And it's that hypothetical, it's that basic fiction, that presumption of future growth that actually gives all that wealth to those billionaires who started that company or their owners of that company or investors. <clears throat> so what we're looking at is this growth-based economy with, and it's, it requires these overriding parameters has got to, got to keep growing at all costs. Otherwise, everything collapses. And um, it's got to monetize everything as fast as possible. And it does that by turning humans basically into consumer zombies, like in, invading our minds, making us consume so it can keep growing. And from the production side, exploiting every available resource on the earth. And as a result of this system, we're now at this place <coughs> where... 69 of the world's 100 largest economies are now these growth-based um, shareholder-owned transnational corporations. So this basically is a system that is designed to mint billionaires. And it's done a great job of that. Um, and it's actually done such a great job that it's led to the greatest inequality in all of history, where right now the wealthiest 26 billionaires own as much wealth as half 
the entire world's population. So this system, the way it is right now, is clearly not sustainable, which has led many and an increasing number of people to ask this question, is our civilization headed for collapse? And or, here's the key question, can we transform our society for a flourishing future? Now, <clears throat> if we did something like this, this transition that would be needed, it would be one of the greatest transitions in all of human history. There have really only been a couple of times from when, <clears throat> when humans first evolved on this earth where there's been such a transition in the human experience. One was about 10,000 years ago when the hunter-gatherer way of life began to transition into agriculture. Another was just a few hundred years ago with the scientific revolution. The transition we need is on a magnitude similar to those. Now, as Samir mentioned, I've actually spent a lot of my years um, studying exactly these kinds of changes in history. And a lot of what I uh, came up with is in this book, The Patterning Instinct, a cultural history of humanity's search for meaning, which looks at the different ways in which cultures have made sense of the universe all the way from hunter-gatherer times to the present. But one essential finding that came out of this book can be uh, distilled quite simply and quite clearly, which is like this, that culture shapes values and those values shape history. And by the same token, our values will shape the future. So because of these key elements about this transitions in history, before we look at this kind of transition that I'm talking about, the transition, this potential transition to an ecological civilization, I'm gonna take a few minutes to look back a little bit at these other great transitions that happened in human history because it helps to set that context so we can get a real sense of what we need to be doing. So as we look at these, what, one of the things we're going to see is that each of these transitions came around as a result of shifts in the dominant root metaphors underlying the sense of nature and the natural world that then led all of the different elements of a culture to make sense of the universe. So we'll start off um, with looking for a few minutes um, <clears throat> at the hunter-gatherers who really uh, were the only ways in which humans actually were on this earth for about 95% of our history. Now, hunter-gatherers viewed nature, their root metaphor, their root story of nature was that nature is a giving parent. And from that, um, so logical entailments just naturally came or, or arose from that, that all living beings, therefore, are family. And there was a sense that we all have an intimate relationship with spirits, that we can trust nature to meet our needs, and that everything is connected. And <clears throat> that, of course, uh, nature being the giving parent, the natural world has intrinsic value. Now that all changed about 10,000 years ago with the rise of agriculture when a different root metaphor um, took root in the human collective mind. And this one was more like a hierarchy of the gods. Now, this metaphor <clears throat> really arose first from this key attribute of the rise of agriculture, which has to do with separation. I view something like this fence as being iconic um, in the, as an image for what agriculture means, because it was all about humans separating themselves from nature. So you have a cultivated field and then the wilderness out there. And just as importantly, that fence separated humans from other humans. So if a farmer got lucky and was able to grow more crops than his neighbor, um, he didn't want to give the crops to the other person. So he would put up these fences to protect his property from others. And from that, hierarchies began to develop. Um, and from the hierarchies that people lived in, they began to understand the entire cosmos as basically being a hierarchy of the gods. No more nature is a giving parent. This is now a hierarchy 
<clears throat> in the cosmos. And they began to see an intrinsic value in wealth, in possessions, and power. And this kind of sense that you can't trust the gods and the, therefore you need to worship them, you need to sacrifice to them, you need a, a priesthood to intermediate for you, um, and you need to respect the hierarchy, and just as importantly, the patriarchy, because this was also the, with agriculture came the birth of the patriarchy. Now <clears throat> women became the, the property of the male, they became objectified sexually, they were excluded from power, they were silenced in the public sphere, and um, the historian Mary Beard explains this so powerfully um, from this one scene in, um, in the Odyssey where Odysseus is gone and his wife Penelope is in a group meeting with her son Telemachus and other, uh, other warriors. And Telemachus says to his mother Penelope, mother, go back to your quarters. Speech will be the business of men. And it was a business of men <clears throat> for millennia in every one of the agrarian civilizations that developed around the world. And it stayed that way in history <clears throat> until something fundamental changed again one more time just a few hundred years ago with the scientific revolution. Here there was a new metaphor of nature that arose, and a machine or a resource to exploit. The scientific revolution was based on this revolutionary new concept that nature is a machine. And if it's a machine, you can take it apart, figure out how it works. And if you can figure out how it works, you can manipulate it, which led to this vision of the conquest of nature, which is really best summarized by <clears throat> this kind of prophet of the scientific age, Francis Bacon, who talked about how we can establish and extend the power of dominion of the human race itself over the universe. We can render ourselves the masters and possessors of nature. And as the Europeans began to do that, they didn't stop at wanting to be the masters and possessors of nature, but they took this notion of conquering nature to conquering other continents and other peoples around the world. <clears throat> and it was this way of thinking, the sense of conquest and exploitation and supremacy over nature, which led <clears throat> to that racist ideology that we're living with still today of white supremacy that the Europeans imposed on other cultures around the world. It led to the genocide of the indigenous people in North and South America, where 99% <clears throat> of the population got wiped out. It led to the horrendous enslavement and transportation of 12 mil million plus Africans as slaves to the Americas. And it led, <clears throat> that way of thinking led to our modern dominant system of values. So let's take just a look at what is this modern story <clears throat> that we get from this set of values. Well, basically it's a story of separation. It's a story that tells us that nature is a machine that humans are separate from nature, that humans are separate from each other, that human progress arises from the conquest of nature, and the earth is a resource to be used for human benefit. And ultimately, <clears throat> from all of this, the purpose of life is to exploit as much as you can to get wealthy and powerful. And so this story is what's led to our modern worldview. And if the fence was an icon of agriculture, <clears throat> something like this is really iconic for our modern world, where everyone is separate from each other. They're made that way by connecting with their technology and totally separate from the food, whatever it is that they're lining to pick up. And this story is told in all the media, <clears throat> all the mainstream messages that we get. So when we just turn on the TV, <clears throat> whatever it might be, whatever the story might be that day on the news, what's really being told is that we are all separate from each other, that we are all selfish, that nature is a machine, and that whatever it is, technology is the solution. And ultimately, everything is meaningless, so fill it with consumerism. That's the story that's led to this ransacking of the earth. That's the story that's led to this existential crisis of climate breakdown. So the big question comes, 
what would it take to transition from this place we're in right now to a different story, a, to an ecological civilization? So obviously the question to ask first is, well, <clears throat> what is an ecological civilization? civilization? Basically, we can understand it as a transformation in the basis of our global civilization from one that is wealth-based to one that is life-based. And we're talking with an ecological civilization about a complete global, cultural, economic system <clears throat> that would actually promote sustainable flourishing for humans and earth. And the principles of this civilization would be based on the principles of ecology, which is how living systems self-organize. And economies can remain resilient and healthy if left undisturbed by human impact for millions of years. It's the wisdom that life evolved over the billions of years that it's been on Earth. <clears throat> and <clears throat> this ecological civilization would have with it a very different root story, which is really quite simply this, that we are all interconnected in the web of life. Now, I'm so excited by this vision. I'm going to go into it a little bit more, but something to understand about this vision, it's, it's an emerging vision that's come from diverse sources. It doesn't belong to me or any number of people writing about it or any group of people. It's a vision that arises from indigenous models for life affirming values, from community movements all around the world like transition towns and others, um, from political movements looking to um, establish racial justice, and gender equity, um, from modern spiritual movements um, coming from traditional Chinese principles or engaged Buddhism or deep ecology. So in all these principles together, all these movements together have led to this vision that's emerging of what is possible. And now I'm going to take you through some of the um, key principles of what an ecological civilization actually would be based on, coming from these principles of nature, what we can learn from ecology. So the first, probably the most important of all, is this principle of symbiosis. That's actually how the richness of life on this earth evolved over billions of years from one entity um, working out with another all around ecosystems, relationships where each party gains, just like the, <clears throat> the bee there and the flower. And how this would translate in, to, in a human society would be principles like fairness, justice, equity, individual dignity for all. Another key principle is known as holarchy. And a holarchy basically is just a word for explaining how in living systems, each system contains systems within it and is contained as part of a bigger system. It's a sense of the fractal nature of ecologies. Each part is part of a greater whole. And in a holarchy, um, a holarchy is only healthy when all of the different systems within the overall system are also healthy. So this great principle is that the health of the whole system requires the flourishing of each part. Another key principle in ecologies is diversity. A system's health depends on differentiation of all the different species and parts of that system and their integration with each other. <clears throat> and that translates into a human society with a sense of the inherent right of each person and community to participate in cultural, political, and economic power. Another key principle we see in ecological systems is balance. Every part is in a harmonious relationship with the entire system. <clears throat> if we think about how that applies to a human system, well, it would mean transforming this growth-based uh, system economy that's completely out of balance with a steady state economy, one which has equitable distribution of wealth and power. Another fascinating element of ecologies um, is this notion of uh, things happen at the grassroots level. 
the system as a whole might affect each of the different parts, but the parts all make their decisions. Each clump of grass decides what's good for it. So this, it leads to this notion of subsidiarity, uh, which is basically um, means decision-making takes place at the lowest level in the system that's possible. Key element of what an ecological civilization could look like. And another <clears throat> principle is embeddedness, recognizing humanity as being part of the natural world, which I thought was really best uh, <clears throat> described in this slogan I saw in Paris during COP21 in 2015. We are not fighting for nature, we are nature defending itself. And then finally, there's this principle of regeneration. In ecologies, they flourish because the parts are always regenerating all in the whole ecosystem. So that, if applied to human society on earth, would lead to sustainable flourishing into the long-term future on the living earth. And that's really best summarized by the statement of the Iroquois Confederacy here in North America, where I am. They talk about how in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. So with these principles in mind, obviously the next question we need to um, look at is what would an ecological civilization actually look like in practice? So I'll take you few through just a very brief kind of tour of what that might actually manifest as. Well, first we'd see a drastic reduction in global income inequality, a just transition from fossil fuels, um, a global wealth tax applied across the board, uh, probably the imposition of a universal basic income. So everyone would get enough income for their basic needs. Um, and crucially, property being returned to the commons. Um, it's been basically stolen from the commons over the past hundreds of years and millennia, but returning to the commons. Another key thing we'd see is corporations existing for humanity rather than for shareholder returns. Now, some of you may be familiar with what we already see in the world today is this concept of benefit corporations or B Corps, uh, where a company can certify it as a, B, as a B Corp. And the idea is to consider that the company is then meant to legally uh, be directed to consider the impact of its decisions on workers, customers, suppliers, community, the environment, not just shareholders. Well, right now, about 3,000 companies worldwide have elected to do that, but they are a tiny drop in the ocean compared to these global transnational corporations. And when they do that, they suddenly have to compete on a non-level playing field because they're trying to factor in these other needs, whereas the companies that aren't doing that can just basically pollute all they want, destroy workers' rights all they want because they just have this one goal is shareholder um, is growth in shareholder profits. So in an ecological civilization, we'd see a triple bottom line required for corporate charters. A triple bottom line means a bottom line, not just a profit, but for people um, and planet at the same time. And we'd be looking at these transnational, transnational corporations fundamentally reorganized and their charters would only be renewed at the discretion of community representatives if they met those triple bottom lines. And along with that, we'd see um, drastic changes such as strict limits on advertising that right now is designed to turn consumers into basically, uh, to turn people into zombie consumers. We'd be seeing a significant increase in worker-owned co-ops becoming a major force in global commerce, which just naturally bring with them more ecological values. And a great example of that is Mondragon in Spain, which is a hugely powerful and successful force um, in that country and is a worker-owned co-op. We'd be seeing a circular economy, which actually increases employment while reducing waste with products designed for repair and recycling, sourcing from recycled materials with a virtual elimination of waste. We'd be looking at the redesign of cities on ecological principles with community gardens in every block, with the extensive use of energy efficient designs for building, rooftop gardens, the use of aquaponics, cars banned from city centers. And no matter where you lived in the city, essential services always being within a 20 minute walk. So you'd never need those cars anyway. 
out of the city, we'd be looking at agroecology replacing global industrial monocrops that are destroying biodiversity on the earth today. And, and this would be based on principles of permaculture and regenerative agriculture, leading to greater crop biodiversity, greater water and carbon efficiency, the virtual elimination of synthetic fertilizer and the elimination of factory farming. We'd be measuring the success of this civilization, not by GDP, gross domestic product growth, which only really measures the rate at which the natural world and human life is like sucked into the monetized economy. But we'd be measuring with things like a genuine progress indicator, which is an actual indicator that's been developed that factors in negatives such as income inequality, pollution and crime, and positives that aren't even counted in GDP, like volunteer work, household work, or education we'd be looking at a far more muscular United Nations with enforcement powers over the global commons like oceans, atmosphere, environment. Um, and at the UN, we'd be seeing a, rights, a declaration of a rights of nature, just like the um, declaration of human rights that would put the natural world on the same legal standing as humanity with personhood given to ecosystems, rivers, high functioning mammals and ecocide defined as an international crime. Now, many of you might look at these ideas and feel just energized and excited and inspired by them, but ask yourself, well, really, how realistic is this, given where things are at right now? Is this more like just kind of a pipe dream? But one of the things that is amazing to look at in history is the non-linear way in which culture transforms. That th the, when we see how change can happen, which is totally unexpected, and it's just amazing to see how quickly these kind of things can take place. I'll take you through a few examples to give you a sense of what I mean. Women's suffrage is a great uh, one to look at. Like Emmeline Pankhurst founded the National Union for Women's Suffrage in England in 1897. It took her 10 years to just get 3,000 people to march in London on the streets with her for the uh, women's right to vote. But within just a couple of decades, women were gaining the right to vote all around the world, even though that it seemed like impossible at the time. You see something civ similar in civil rights in the United States in 1955. Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat on the bus in a whites only part of the bus. There was a bus boycott lasted over a year. Black churches were burned, black citizens were arrested. And it was less than 10 years later that Martin Luther King led this march on Washington um, with over 200,000 people. <clears throat> and it, within a year, the Civil Rights Act was passed into law by P President Johnson. Now, in this country where I live right now, the United States, there's still tremendous work to be done for black people to have even close to equal um, treatment as white people. But this was a fundamental shift that happened that nobody thought was even possible. We see similar things in Europe. When the Berlin Wall <clears throat> was constructed in 1961, it was like this manifestation of the Iron Curtain separating East from West. It was the symbol of the Cold War with these two sides locked in by ideology that people couldn't even dream how it could ever end. And then uh, as Gorbachev loosened restrictions in 1988, um, within a year, German people were mobbing the gates in November, 1989. And it was just a month later that the Cold War was declared over. In more recent times, and uh, here's a Greta Thunberg in August, 2018, sitting there all alone, skipping school to begin her solitary demonstration outside the Swedish parliament. Just one year later, and there's more than 4 million people going on clim a global climate strike in solidarity with her and a climate emergency declared by the UK, France, and over a thousand jurisdictions around the world. So what we see from this is that public support follows a non-linear path of change. That there's an early adoption phase, when you have this kind of ideological lock-in, um, people stick with received attitudes and opinions, even when they become out of date. There's a sense of social rigidity, political inertia, 
you know, the thing that you'll hear people say is, it'll never happen. And then there is a tipping point. And you begin to experience this crescendo of change when influential thought leaders start to attract increasing numbers. And humans naturally have a, what, a herd instinct, which uh, we, and is actually a healthy thing because it's helped humans to basically live together and work together and share their values together. Um, but that herd instinct suddenly begins to shift the direction towards that new way of thinking when the stickiness of the old thinking is superseded by the pull of those new ideas. And then it moves to this new stable state when those new ways of thinking become institutionalized. When, of course, there's still diehard reactionaries, but they're now in the minority. And then, of course, everyone says, well, it was inevitable. So what about the potential for this kind of transition to happen for an ecological civilization? Well, the one thing that uh, certainly seems to lead towards the expectation of these drastic changes, the magnitude of the crisis we're all looking at right now, the climate emergency, the incredible global inequality, the environmental collapse we're experiencing, the breakdown of political norms. And along with that, another positive feature we see is the rise of the internet. Um, this possibility, this increased transmittal speed of new ideas, such as this kind of uh, summit that's happening right now around the world. Uh, and along with that comes this emergent global sense of a shared humanity. On the other hand, the, there's tremendous, it's a tremendous hurdle to rec recognize that we need to make this change happen in only a few decades. We don't have hundreds or thousands of years like um, the, those earlier changes in human history had. And this one has to be done with intentionality. We need to consciously change our own values and behavior. So there's no doubt that this kind of tra trajectory to an ecological civilization would represent a unique achievement in human history. And to understand that a little bit more as we begin to wrap up, let me just go back to this finding I took from uh, in my book, The Patterning Instinct, Culture Shapes Values, Values Shape History, and Our Values Will Shape the Future. So what we're really looking at for this transformation to an ecological civilization ultimately is a transformation in values, an emphasis on the quality of life rather than material possessions, prioritizing progress in quality, not quantity, basing our political, social, and economic choices on a sense of our shared humanity and emphasizing justice and dignity for all. And finally, building civilization's future on the basis of symbiosis with the living earth, where the flourishing of the natural world becomes a foundational principle. And I'll just leave you with these words of Margaret Mead that I love so much because they're so true. And she said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I just really want to take that moment to thank all of you joining this world, this summit right now, uh, the, the Future Law Summit, to recognize that you are part of that group that has the ability to really change our world. And so just as I leave, um, if you, anybody can take a screenshot of that, if you want to just connect with my uh, prior book, The Patterning Instinct, the book that is coming out next spring, The Web of Meaning, and these are websites where you can connect with my writings um, on the web. So thanks very much for listening to that. I'm now going to get out of our screen share and uh, join back so you can see my full face and the face of uh, Samir and uh, others in the conversation. So thank you very much for that. Jeremy, thank you so much to you for, for sharing with us those ideas and enlightening vision of this ecological civilization. I mean, the one thing that strikes me is that this vision that you've just laid out for us, it just makes sense. You know, it's just it's just so natural. It's going back to the core of who we are and what we are in the context of the world that we live in. So I, it's 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 just it feels like coming home. Uh, you know, that's really kind of the circle uh, in some ways that we're coming back to. 
you know, I think that's such a great point, Samir, because something that I, uh, that, that really gives me hope oftentimes when I look at the current situation and we see the dire way in which the world is going. And we look at the way in which um, this kind of consumer-based uh, mass hypnosis model uh, tries to um, basically hypnotize people through television and marketing and advertising um, to become part of this system. We go, well, how do we change that? But what's amazing about it is that as human beings, this ecological system is what we relate to. So really, every time a new person is born on this earth, this is what they are born into naturally. They evolved to want this ecological civilization. So in fact, we have in ways an easier job than the destructive system has. The destructive system has to actually actively condition every person to move away from what is really naturally what they want to something that actually they don't want that something that really right. destroys the quality of their lives all we need to do is basically is get people to get back in touch with their own hearts with their own living desires and we're already there but jeremy uh, when it is so simple as you're laying it out right now for us to just to connect with who we are very basically why is it so difficult uh, for us to do that, both as individuals and as a collective? You know, what are the forces that are preventing us from doing what is natural and simple? Well, I think, <clears throat> above all, these forces are these systems of basically uh, exploitation and supremacy that have become so much part of our world. So, you know, and I, I do think these... these um, this transnational corporation domination of our world is a huge part of our problem. But I think we also have to look deeper than that because um, people might reasonably say, well, you know, those um, authoritarian regimes and those, re those patriarchal regimes that happened before capitalism came along also were separating people and caused widespread misery. It's not like we all lived mm -hmm. in this happy ecological system until uh, and corporations and capitalism came along. So I think we have to recognize there were these layers of separation from, our, from where we actually want to live as human beings. If we go back to our earliest hunter-gatherer days, where we live 95% of our time, we evolved as human beings to live in that way. We evolved to actually live in, in bands with people. We evolved to actually um, share our, our property with people. We evolved to care about what um, people thought about us, but we involve things like compassion, group identity, these um, emotions that are called um, human um, moral emotions that make us feel good and found when we lack this way and when other people do, fairness, generosity. These are all evolved parts of our humanity. Now, we are not going to go back to those hunter-gatherer times. Um, and there were also bad things about hunter-gatherer times, too. I'm not trying to set that up as a golden age, but more to recognize that as humans, what we need to do is to actually construct a society that evolves to actually um, nurture those qualities. Instead, what global corporate capitalism has done is with great sophistication, they've identified those same qualities and they've perverted each one. They've manipulated each one to actually get humans to get addicted to, um, like we have this as hunter-gatherers, it was absolutely natural for us to want sugar uh, because that, that was a good thing you could find rarely. Um, it was natural for us to want fat. So the corporations go, great, let's like um, use that and turn that against people so they become unhealthy and addicted, so then they desire our products. Hmm. Um, it's natural for humans to want status within their community. So these, um, these uh, tech companies now that have become part of the global corporate capitalist system go, great, how do we manipulate that with thumbs up signs and things saying like, you know, click back so we can addict people to their, um, to their uh, devices so then we can get more advertising dollars through them. So in each way, these corporations have found what it is that makes us healthy, happy, and they've perverted it for in order to profit from us. Mm. That's what we need to recognize and that's what we need to and refuse to become part of and come up with alternative systems that actually um, reach in to nurture those qualities in us. You know, uh, Jeremy, an interesting point that, that you raised is 
that most of our lifetime as human beings, as a species, has been in these hunter-gatherers, you know, days where we were so reliant on one another, so intimately and and connected with you know the natural world around us. So for me, when you say that, it actually gives me hope because we just we are so evolved to care and be compassionate for one another and the world around us. We've just been, as you've mentioned, kind of hypnotized into a different way of thinking and living that uh, you know we've just disconnected from from what really is. So I think that's a really uh, you know a really good good thing that to know that we can trust ourselves and our bodies that that, yes. that, that, that that we're that it's there the information we need the wisdom it's there it's just that we have to connect with it i think that's a crucially important point that you raise that we really need to know we can trust ourselves and each of us has to actually find our own path to do that there are spiritual paths where it can be through meditation or other paths to really connect with those parts of ourselves and and give ourselves that love it can be connecting with nature and it can be and some people um nowadays might use um psychedelic or um, uh, different kind of medicines to actually connect with that. Some people might reach out to indigenous cultures who never lost that kind of tradition and try to learn from them, uh, hopefully without exploiting them at the same time as they're doing right, that. Right, right. And, and, but in each case, I think each of us has a personal journey to unlearn, to basically, as it's called sometimes, to decolonize our minds. Um, because all of our minds get colonized by this notion of uh, whether it's white supremacy, if you're white, uh, or just the, the ideology around that, or human supremacy, this sense that humans are somehow better than the rest of the living earth. We need mm. to reconnect with what hunter-gatherers always knew, naturally. You know, Jeremy, we're, we're at the Negotiating the New Normal Summit. And the reason that we're having this summit is because we recognize that, as you mentioned in your presentation, the normal that we have is just not working. There's something that's not working. All the crises we face, you know, many different fronts are just signals to us that things need to change very fundamentally. But I'd like to ask you, Jeremy, if, if we reflect on the system that we're in right now, what do you think, what do you observe as the elements in our current system that we are going to bring with us to the ecological civilization? So what is working that we can be yeah. proud of? That is a, that is a great question. Um, and there's a lot working that we can be proud of. And, um, you know, well, when we looked at that whole history that I laid out, um, in each case, when we moved from hunter-gatherers to agrarian civilizations, when we moved from agrarian to scientific revolution, this amazing accumulation of richness of human culture came with that. So um, while agrarian civilization brought us patriarchies and hierarchies, um, it also brought with us the specializations that led to creativity and great cultural spiritual traditions from Buddhism, mm. Taoism, um, and uh, all, all these great traditions from all over the world. When we saw the rise of the scientific revolution, it's brought us these incredible technologies that allow just this kind of conversation to happen today. So in fact, you know, when, when we look at the risk of collapse and beyond the terror of this sense of like everything unraveling that is so scary just it just feels into this great tragedy of what a loss it would be um for humanity to lose what we have gained so far right now so i think um our, our technologies uh, are just have this incredible power for good but Right now, they've been subverted to this global capitalist for-profit system. But those same technologies can be developed in incredible, wonderful ways to begin from the notion of the global commons, which I know is going to be explored a lot in the summit. And how can we wrest technology from capitalist uh, structures to more commons-based ways of using it? That's one, one sort of great example and one great challenge. Right. Um, and I, I think uh, beyond... Uh, technology, we also have great concepts that have arisen. So there are these, in just the last few hundred years, concepts like um, so the sense of human rights, uh, the sense of uh, global justice for all. There are these amazing ideas which didn't uh, arise in those agrarian re regimes that actually have only arisen as people have begun to have a bigger view of what's possible. Right. Right. Those are the things I think we can take with us to our to a new civilization. 
And it's going to be exciting, of course, you know, once we get there, that only then will we get, we'll be able to look retrospectively at some of the things that, that come with us. But I think we can, we, we can know, as we do now, that these fundamental sort of qualities of compassion and care, and maybe, you know, some, some negative qualities too, they'll, they're likely to sort of come with us. But I think it's, it's also really crucial, Jeremy, that you share with us that what makes this, this uh, evolution, this step so different from what has come before is that it's intentional and conscious. And that means that we actually decide what it's going, going to be. Uh, and we play a role in, in shaping this future that's, that's coming ahead of us. So I think that's terribly exciting, but also kind of nerve wracking, right? Because that puts responsibility on our shoulder. But it does mean that we're, we can be creators of, of our world and reality. Yes, it does. I, I think that that is what you say is so right that there is this responsibility that arises once we recognize that the future is actually not like a spectator sport. It's not something that happens out there. It's actually something that we are all co-creating together. But along with that awesome responsibility comes oftentimes a sense of a, almost a liberation when we begin to realize that none of us alone are gonna be the ones to do it. It's actually mm -hmm. through our shared collaborative transformation that this can actually happen. So one thing that I, th one important lesson that I take from that is realizing that no matter what each of us is doing that we feel is incredibly important that we want everybody to know about is to spend as much time as we're spending on telling other people about that, to listen to what others are doing and to spend our time asking, how can I actually um, spend significant portion of my energy lifting up and amplifying the stuff that other people are focused on that might relate to what I'm doing, but not directly related to it. This is not about um, our individual um, hero uh, type approach, like I'm gonna be the one to transform the world and make it better. But it's about how can I be part of something that is so much bigger than me? Mm. And that's, so we get both the sense of responsibility and liberation that comes from that. And I think it's beautiful that you mentioned that because I think the Future Law Collaborative in this summit is really, an attempt, an initiative to try to bring this community of people together, bring us together and figure out how we can support each other in, in changing the world. I'd like to take a moment now to, to ask our audience, for, for people that are in the room, uh, if, if you have any questions, feel free to just unmute yourself and, and, and share with us and share with Jeremy uh, what you'd like to bring to the table. Yeah, Jeremy, I think uh, your presentation uh, was very insightful, in fact, on how we should go ahead as, uh, in the future uh, to live cohesively. In, in, in the global world. Um, the question that I have is uh, pertaining to the coronavirus and the greatest inequality in terms of wealth that you mentioned in your presentation about the 26 uh, billionaires in the world who accumulate half of the world's wealth or so. Uh, do you think that's, that, that has become uh, a more increasingly uh, major issue during this coronavirus or was it uh, a major issue even before? Oh, yes. Well, it was absolutely a major issue before, and the coronavirus has only exacerbated it massively. It's just mind-boggling to discover that, like in my country, the United States, while you have this um, horrendous system with uh, people not even having access to health care, um, tens of millions of people having lost their jobs and now having no idea where they're even going to make money, those the, the billionaires as a whole have increased their wealth by about 30%. Uh, in since coronavirus began. There's this incredible statistic that Jeff Bezos alone uh, could, uh, if he took just the increase in his wealth since coronavirus began, he could actually give $100,000 to every Amazon employee uh, from just that increase in his wealth. It's like yeah. the, the, the numbers just boggle the mind. And I think what we're seeing with coronavirus is really just um, an early stage of the kind of incredible... Um, disconnects um, mm. and imbalances that we'll be experiencing more and more in the next, in the years and decades to come. Mm. Because basically we have a world system that is unraveling. Coronavirus in a way is a little bit like a, a kind of, I mean, horrendous it is, is. And it's transformed our lives and all of us uh, and so many people have suffered so much. 
but it's really just this tiny little dress rehearsal compared to the kind of disruptions we are going to be experiencing. And I, I'm not saying this with glee. I, this is a, gonna be a, a very, very difficult time for the human race and for the, all the living uh, earth in, in general, which it already is. But mm. the hope that arises from that is just realizing that as the system begins to unravel, as these pieces begin to come apart, there's more potential for us to consciously reweave mm. that system into a way that makes more sense. So uh, we don't want these things to happen, but as they happen, it does present more of an opportunity for actually that reweaving to take place. And as this system unravels, younger generations, as they come of age, they look at what their parents tell them and they say, screw it, we don't accept that. This system <laughs> is not working. So you'll see these massive shifts, just like we were describing um, in this presentation, uh, that right now it's hard to even conceive of, but uh, the inconceivable, I think, will be happening uh, before we even realize it. You know what's interesting, Jeremy, as, as you mentioned before, again, this, this point of intentionality and consciously creating our future, I, I, I wonder if, you know, this, this COVID pandemic and some of these crises that we're facing, that they're actually forcing intentionality in some ways, right? Like these, these forces, because they're, they're just forcing us to change our ways at such a profound level. We have to stay 1.5 meters away from each other. We have to, you know, do this, wear mouth caps, be respectful of the other, you know? struggles are, are are never really fun but struggles do enable growth so I, I i wonder if you could sort of reflect on that or or you know think maybe what this covid pandemic and these crises mean in the context of the ecological civilization that we want to lead yeah uh, lean into sure absolutely yeah and i think a lot of people are realizing that it when they're forced to change their habits it does have them get to be a little bit more conscious just like you're saying and and start to ask questions about things they took for granted. I mean, this kind of meeting is just one great example that um, I, I don't know if originally it, what it would have been with, with COVID, but maybe it might've been an on-site meeting with people flying all around the world to get together, which has its own great benefits, of course. But then as we know, it has these massive cost of carbon emissions. But so we've begun to realize, oh, we can actually connect. In fact, in some ways we're getting more connected with the more of the sense of this global um, super organism of humanity through that. And a lot of people also are realizing, well, I can actually spend more time with my family <clears throat> than I thought was possible. And I can rethink this notion of commuting that I, so I think that um, changes that are forced on us do lead to some of these shifts in consciousness that we need. And I do think that that is a hope. And as we said, um, as I mentioned, I think we got to recognize this is just a relatively small one compared to the disruptions we will be seeing, but they don't have to be bad in that respect. They can lead to great opportunities. Jeremy, what do you think are some of the most important questions that we should all be asking ourselves at this moment in time? Yeah, well, thank you for that great, that great question. And well, I think one really great question for people to ask is to really say to yourself, one is, where are these structures of, of, su of supremacy, human supremacy over nature or uh, uh, white supremacy over non-whites or where are these, these structures, where have they colonized my mind? And where am I caught in patterns of behavior that actually I'm not even realizing? So really uh, actually ask ourselves these questions about our own life and our own presumptions. And you know, in for people who practice mindfulness meditation, there's this um, notion of once you begin to be mindful of the stories you tell yourself, you, you begin to be liberated from those stories. Hmm. And similarly, we can practice like cultural mindfulness. Ask ourselves, what are these underlying metaphors? What are these stories our culture is telling us? And how can I rise above that? So that's one key question, I think. And then the second one, really is along the lines of that recognition that we co-create the future. To really say like, um, once I recognize that I am part of this complex interdependent co um, system, this web that is actually our human superorganism that we're talking about, how can I be most effective in not just making my particular thing look most successful, but be most effective in helping this entire system to transform?
Mm. I think these are these are some really really valuable questions, and they they open up doors. Even when you just pose them right now, I'm thinking, wow, okay, so many so many uh, ways to to consider and opportunities. I have a question that that came in from from Rob uh, that I'd love to pose to you, Jeremy, and that is, um, how is the idea of humans othering themselves from nature affecting how we're treating the world? Yeah, well, I think that is right on the target. It's, it's basically causing us to um, really destroy the living earth. I mean, that statistic I uh, put up earlier in that presentation, to just, just to take a breath and realize 68% loss in animal populations around the world just since 1970 alone. We basically, because we treat nature as a resource to exploit, um, we have essentially denuded the vast bulk of the richness, the abundance of the earth. It's quite terrible to recognize and even more to recognize that we're doing it at a faster and faster rate as time goes on. And that gets in, involved even in the policy ideas that get developed, even when we're looking at the disasters we're causing. So to me, one of the most terrifying things is when people look at the climate emergency we're facing right now and say, oh yeah, this is so bad. What we need is develop um, geoengineering. This is the mm -hmm. ultimate metaphor of seeing nature as a machine saying, rather than, oh, we humans are doing something that we need to transform so we can be in harmony with this home that we live on. It says, oh, the earth is, it's just like a machine that's not working properly. It's now, you know, the, the carbon is out of balance. So we just need to fix, come up with a better machine to fix the machine that's out of balance. And so you get mm -hmm. these crazed ideas of, you know, putting like trillions of little bits of uh, sulfur or whatever out in, in the atmosphere to reflect the, the sun back. And then <clears throat> these ideas about uh, just really shifting the very basis of the earth, um, which of course will only lead to even greater imbalances once if those things even do, do get developed. But right. I think we see this desperation here that the capitalist way of thinking is so embedded that the last thing uh, the people who are part of that system want to think about is how can I actually do something different? They just want to say, well, things are so out of control. How can we then just um, figure out how to re-engineer this earth so we can keep growing at this crazed mm. rate? Mm. You know, that brings up a question in, in me, Jeremy, that I've been wondering, uh, you know, in reading your work as well and hearing what you've shared with us here today. And that is, you know, with these, with these that we have and these cultural values which in some ways can be quite abstract concepts when we're talking about them right how, how is it that these root metaphors become sort of concretized into our lives and lifestyles and you know to what extent is the story informing our action and to what extent is our environment and action informing the story that's a great question that you raise actually and um is actually something I discuss in the um, in the preface to my book is this notion of these feedback loops that work in both directions, and um, because if you back um, in the way that sort of the study of history is developed, um, a couple of decades ago, people like Jared Diamond and others, uh, a lot of people will be familiar with his work, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Um, but he, he was just one among other historians who were coming up with this, at that time, really innovative new way of looking at history, saying history is not about like the, the, the Europeans were dominant because of something to do with their culture, but it was actually just to do with geography. Um, <clears throat> because up until then, there was this uh, notion of this, this kind of European triumphalism, like, oh, you know, this is where these great ideas developed in Europe. So it's natural that humans mm -hmm. uh, took over the rest of the world, wh whatever it was they were thinking. People like Jared Diamond said, well, actually, no, <clears throat> it was based on simple ge geography. So the simple fact, for example, that um, Eurasia was more like an east to west axis rather than North and South America um, going north to south allowed crops to spread in ways that caused civilization to develop more easily. Or there were like four or five different factors like that. Those are important factors. But what that missed was this other <clears throat> sort of feedback loop in the other direction. So it's not just about the territory or the 
um, subsistence forms affecting the, um, the ways in which people lived, but also the, the cognition that people developed then affects the actual physical reality, the history that takes place. And so <clears throat> that's one of what we see um, in ways in which different cultures actually started to move in different directions based on the way they made sense of things. Um, so it's very much a, a complex, uh, one of the ways in which complex systems work often is that two systems affect each other so that you can't actually predict where they're going to go uh, because of this like uh, nonlinear biofeedback that takes place. And we actually seeing that in the world today, we have like a cognitive system, our cultural system, our uh, system of thought, and we have a physical system like a climate breakdown or uh, ecological degradation or whatever it might be. Um, and these two systems are acting together. So it's one system, that's why we can't be determinist about where things are going, because no matter what happens in one system, the other system is actually changing it. Right. I, I have uh, another question here from uh, Kareem, actually. And maybe, Kareem, I'd like to invite you to, to uh, voice that if you, if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, you talked a little bit about indigenous, in, indigenous communities and the enormous transgressions that uh, colonialism and conquest and slavery and even genocide brought to those communities across the world. Now that occurs to me then that there's, there's just a huge, huge healing process and reconciliation process that needs to happen. And it occurs to me, I, something I've been wondering for ages, like how do we start tapping into that wisdom of the ages, that ancient wisdom that can actually help us navigate towards the ecological civilization? Maybe you can reflect. Yes, well, I think that um, that is a great point. And one of the things <clears throat> that we can do is to make sure that those of us who are in positions of relative power in the world really give the platforms to people from indigenous communities around the world to speak and to share their wisdom and to actually um, bring them to conferences, uh, bring them to places where um, other people might be uncomfortable to have that perspective and make sure their voices are heard. Um, and in fact, that is being done at certain times. Like, um, in fact, uh, in COP21 in Paris, uh, for example, these, uh, this great organization, Amazon Watch, um, partnered with a couple of others to um, bring people from uh, actually right there in Peru and Ecuador, people from, in, from the Amazon. Um, it actually, they even brought some of their canoes to the conference in Paris. And they, they actually uh, went with those canoes on the river to make sure their voice was being heard in these places. Um, and I think that that is something that is increasingly happening, but we need to encourage that to a greatest degree we can. In um, South America, there are these concepts of buen vivir or sumac corsai, which um, basically is um, well, is like Quechua for buen vivir, which just basically translates as living well. But and it's essentially, it's this concept very, very much aligned with the idea of an ecological civilization, of living with uh, Pachamama, living with Mother Earth, and recognizing her as the entity, the living entity that we have to treat as sacred. And those ideas are now written into the constitution of a couple of countries in South America, in Peru and Bolivia. And um, sadly, they're mostly um, just kind of honored by being ignored. But the fact is that some of these ideas are beginning to make their way into our modern way of thinking. We need to encourage that. Um, and I think the um, progressive lawyers recognizing these things have a very significant part to play in that. And, and luckily, we have some of those thinkers and, and people here um, with us today or in the summit, uh, at, at the very least. Um, we have about four minutes left before we uh, uh, round off this, this wonderful keynote and uh, conversation. So I'd like to invite anyone who's in the audience, if you have another question to pose, uh, now's your chance. Otherwise, I have a few of my own still <laughs> that I'd love to ask Jeremy. 
So if um, so, if you if you'd like, you can just unmute yourself uh, and then and then uh, feel free to share. But otherwise, I'll uh, I have a I have a pressing question for you, Jeremy. And that is, what is going to come? What lies beyond the ecological civilization? I love this question. You know, this is what's so wonderful about this notion of the ecological civilization is. This can be in just the same way that um, symbiosis has allowed um, life to exist and just get richer and richer for billions of years. The notion of an ecological civilization can be a gateway to a completely different um, era on Earth, and representing a totally different uh, relationship of symbiosis between humans and Earth together. There's a um, astrobiologist called David Grinspoon, um, who's written a book called Earth in Human Hands, who's done a really lovely job of exploring this way of looking at things. Um, and it's this notion that right now we're aware that we're in the Anthropocene, uh, we, that this is this, uh, we've, we've left the Holocene behind. The Anthropocene is this period of time uh, that is re really distinguished by human domination of these Earth uh, basically every aspect of the earth um, and these incredible imbalances that are taking place. Well, the Anthropocene is a very short-lived era. It's totally unsustainable. We, it can't continue. It's either going to lead to a collapse or it's going to lead to something else. What it has the potential to lead to um, is what actually one person uh, or a couple of people have termed the symbiocene. So <laughs> imagine a world where actually we moved into this ecological civilization and humans developed with developing technologies further. We're not talking about ending, uh, putting an end to this great technological innovation trajectory we're on, but transforming the basis of that technology to be life affirming rather than life destroying. And where we actually get to really become part of the earth of Gaia as a super organism. So that humans have, we have incredible, unique distinctions. We have this ability to be self-aware. We have this ability to uh, develop technology. Then we also have this ability with our animate consciousness, as I call it, to be part of the living earth. So there's this concept that we can actually develop ourselves as humans through the internet and uh, as, it, as it can evolve, but through our connectivity with life to get these deeper and deeper connection with Gaia and really become a super organism with Gaia as the sort of brains, if you will, or the more like the prefrontal cortex, if you will, of, yeah. of Gaia being self-aware with the rest of it. And that kind of civilization could go on for millions of years. We're not talking about, uh, you know, can it last for a few hundred or a few thousand? Um, and in fact, this book by David Grinspoon conjectures that the only civilizations likely to be out there in, in, in the galaxies that we'd ever be in contact with would be ones that pass through this funnel, this incredible difficult time mm -hmm. in their own civilizational growth and it became some version of that symbiocene with their living planet. That's amazing. And I think it's such a crucial point, Jeremy, because I hear so many people with, you know, that, that, uh, that think that we can't grow sustainably, so that we have to stop growing in order for us to live back sustainably. But what you just shared with us is that growth, you know, it's such an innate part of who we are and what nature is. So if we can do this sustainably as a symbio symbiocene, as you mentioned, is a beautiful term. There's so much potential and so much uh, beauty in, in what is and what can be. So um, I, I, unfortunately, we have to close this conversation off. It's really been a pleasure, uh, Jeremy, and for all of the all of those, uh, all of you have joined here uh, with us today. Um, what's going to come next is a, a transition lounge, uh, uh, which is also unique to the summit. Just a moment for us to reflect and just be more present and cultivate some of these qualities that that Jeremy has shared with us uh, today. So, Jeremy, thank you so much for being here. It's really been a pleasure. I enjoyed it tremendously. Thank you so much, Samir and Kareem and everyone else. Thank you. Take care now. Thank you, guys. Take care. Transition Lounge is next.